Good afternoon. So we have uh, four uh, very uh, interesting talks uh, prepared for this afternoon, followed by a panel discussion. And I sincerely hope that uh, all of you can remain and uh, participate. Um, also, I'd like to inform you that uh, the proceedings of this meeting uh, will be available uh, through our website, uh, memristar.ucmerced.edu uh, in two weeks. So if you click on it, uh, you will see the video uh, streaming uh, of this, uh, all the talks. Uh, and uh, I, I was also assured that uh, Citrus will support to have this material available on YouTube. And especially those who made the presentation, I'd like to ask you to give uh, your presentation material to Kim Preciado. Kim, would you please raise your hand in the back? Uh, because we needed to also file a report to National Science Foundation. Otherwise, I go to prison, you know, for that. <laughs> <laughs> so I ask you to please be kind and uh, make sure that Kim uh, gets the material from you. Um, I'd like to introduce our uh, next speaker, uh, Stephen Hellenius. Uh, we have been a uh, colleague for many, many years. Uh, long ago, I was with at and Labs, um, and uh, Steve and I, we worked uh, in the same building at Murray Hill. Uh, Steve in a uh, device uh, processing area, I in a uh, microprocessor development area. And uh, I worked with uh, Steve's organization through one and quarter micron technology and the point nine mic mic at the beginning of a point nine micron technology. So we go a long way. Um, I'm very excited that uh, uh, as an executive vice president of a semiconductor research corporation, which is a consortium of uh, 23 semiconductor companies worldwide, and uh, 100 universities are being sponsored uh, through a uh, semiconductor research corporation for research, and uh, I personally, when I was a faculty at Illinois, had a great benefit uh, through grants and uh, graduate student internship in uh, many, many companies. Uh, so Steve will, uh, Steve will talk uh, about uh, the uh, technology roadmap, which is very, very important because you heard the talk about uh, linking Memlisa technology with the CMOS technology. I think that's uh, going to be a wonderful uh, inroad for three-dimensional integration in the future. And um, Steve uh, did uh, his uh, doctoral study at the uh, University of Pennsylvania, Virginia, uh, before joining uh, Bell Labs. Uh, he spent many years at the Bell Labs and uh, Gear, and then uh, now at the Semiconductor Research Corporation. So let us welcome Steve. Thank you. <laughs> So as the uh, first talk after lunch, I'm not going to make you think a whole lot. Uh, but what, I, what I plan on doing here, the title was selected by Steve when he asked me to give this, and I never changed it. But I'm really, I'm talking about the roadmap, which is the ITRS roadmap, but I'm really talking about the roadmap of how the industry puts things into manufacture, which I think um, uh, will be um, very interesting for, for, for the panel discussion, too. So what, the way I'm going to do this, first of all, uh, just for a little historical perspective and a little bit of, uh, of entertainment, I'll give you a brief transistor history, particularly from the Bell Labs perspective. I'll talk about current trends in, in um, um, scaling, and then I'll turn, um, I'll talk about emerging memory options from two perspectives. One, what the ITRS roadmap is saying, and they just had their <clears throat> the revision of the roadmap, this is an annual event, um, just had the revision of the roadmap rolled out in December, so I'll, I'll report on that. And then um, we had a forum on memory in Singapore in October. In fact, many of, uh, of uh, Dimitri, Pataki, uh, Leon Chua, uh, um, and several others here were at that, that forum. And the way the SRC forums work, it's very similar to this, is we're, we're trying to drive towards the questions that drive the university research. That's what we try to do. So anyway, so that's the whole sum of my talk. Let me start with, uh, to remind you of where the transistor came from. <clears throat> um, 
it was 60 years ago or, or more. Uh, it was John Bardeen, Walt Bratton, and William Shockley all at Bell Laboratories developed the first transistor. And then Jack Kilby combined a few of these to make the integrated circuit. Um, for you, some of you who are too young to remember this, this is the, uh, the first transistor. It used to sit in the lobby of Murray Hill, um, where Steve and I worked for many years. Now I'm not sure where it is, now that Alcatel Lucent uh, <coughs> uh, owns it. Um, but when I was still at Bell Labs, we had a 50th year transistor, uh, anniversary of the transistor, a 50th year anniversary. And we had a big party. And um, we invited everyone who was still alive, who was involved with the transistor, and everyone who, in those 50 years, had worked on it. And uh, I just want to point out a few people. There's Jack Kilby. He gave a talk. There's Gordon Moore. Now, these are the only two guys that I'm going to single out that didn't work for Bell Laboratories. Um, you have Herman Gummel, the Gummel number, Jim Early, the early voltage. You have Al Cho, who developed uh, a lot of the MBE um, uh, deposition techniques. Um, Simon Z, who you've already used his book for uh, either for teaching or for learning. Um, Bernie Murphy, who developed Murphy's Law, not the Murphy's Law that everyone knows, <laughs> but Murphy's Law on, on uh, defects. And um, George Smith, who just got the, Bell, the, uh, the Nobel Prize this year for a CCD. And uh, Walter Brown, a single in hat, because he was the only full-time employee of Bell Labs who was a full-time employee of Bell Labs when the transistor was invented. So he was, he was celebrating his 52nd year anniversary. Um, there I am. There's a bunch of other people who you, you would recognize. But I want to make a point about this. At that time, 60 years ago, most of the early developers transistor worked for Bell Laboratories, one large laboratory working <coughs> in relative isolation. Now, actually, when we come full circle in the memoristors, there's some irony to all of what I'm saying, but I'll come back to that. And this is what research looked like 60 years ago. Many industrial laboratories with very little direct collaboration. I mean, they, you know, they went to conferences and they talked about their stuff, but it was kept close to the vest. Universities were not closely tied to the semiconductor industry problems. There wasn't the kind of, uh, um, of interaction we have now. University semiconductor research was mostly funded by the government, and there was really no coordinated research roadmaps amongst the various companies. Research now, there are few industrial laboratories doing fundamental research. <clears throat> Universities are very closely tied to the semiconductor industry uh, problems. I mean, just look at where we are and, and the way that, that this organization is, is um, organized. Um, university semiconductor research is mostly funded by the industry or leveraged industry government collaborations, and I think that's a true statement. And worldwide coordinated, there, there exists worldwide coordinated research roadmaps. <clears throat> and these forums, these coordinated research planning like this meeting, I think are critically important. This is kind of the lifeblood of, of how things get, get uh, set up. Um, I, I actually just, because it stands here, I put this, um, this slide in, because I actually use this slide in defending to our supporters why we have forums. And I pointed out that, <clears throat> that uh, Stan presented the memristor here at Berkeley in um, November of 2007. And it was six months later where the, the activity that, that HP was doing was publicized and um, in a big way. So that's just to, to defend forums. Now let me talk about current trends in, in, um, in just from a scaling perspective. So this is going back to CMOS. Um, there are a couple limitations to CMOS scaling. It's important to continue scaling the, uh, the dimensions. In fact, um, most of the research that SRC funds that Intel and IBM and AMD and Global Foundries and, and the other big IDMs, the big um, uh, material companies now, still feel scaling has a lot of research potential. So uh, a, lot of, a lot of efforts going into scaling. But it's a lot less than it was five years ago. And it's in all of the other areas that the rest of the money is going into. But anyway, the, the one uh, limitation is size. We're still, you know, scaling in size, and with all of the reports of the demise of scaling, we continue on this track. And um, there has to be a limitation, though. I used to say, 
recognize about labs when we were still doing one micron, and people say, where is it end? Well, I say, I don't know, but I know we can't make a transistor smaller than a single atom. I mean, there's a real physical limitation there, but it doesn't look like the, the pace for getting to that point has slowed down. Um, but as the gate dimensions approach, this atomic size, the tunneling quantum effects, these are what are degrading the device operation. And it's going to be, it's going to be a, a um, market-driven uh, limitation that gets us to the last generation of technology. It's going to be too expensive and not enough, not enough advantage. And the other is heat. <clears throat> okay, so this, is, this just shows the uh, progressions of the Pentiums. And um, I think up, up around here somewhere is the core of a nuclear reactor. So uh, um, that's, that just shows where we're going. However, um, what has happened in the last, in, in this period, is we've gone into all of these, uh, these heat, uh, using multi-core architectures, a lot of ways to get around the issues of, of heat generation in, in the high-performance processors. <clears throat> so what are the transistor options now? This is kind of just a snapshot of, of what we're doing, uh, what the industry is doing. It, um, first of all, scaling is increasingly difficult, but there are some, still some solutions for gaining, uh, and, and these are things that are, are mostly implemented now in some way or another. But strain silicon, high K dielectrics, metal gates, these are all introduced in the, in the, the most advanced current technologies. Um, and this is all to get around the issues of leakage, uh, limited carrier uh, velocity, contacts, etc. Um, some of the solutions are, that are longer term are these three-dimensional structures, uh, fin fets, tri-gates, gates all around, three, five channel materials. Um, these are all research topics now, and there's a lot of development going on, but you don't see any of this in production. Interconnect, that's the other big limitation. Um, the solutions the, that we're doing now are, well, copper low K is still being scaled. Um, that was in, implemented uh, seven, eight years ago, uh, but it still has some life in scaling. Longer term solutions are more exotic 3D chip stacking, optical interconnect, um, uh, to some degree 3D chip stacking, chip stacking is going on right now. Uh, optical interconnect at the chip or interchip level is really not happening yet. Anyway, these are, this is the state of both where the industry is and where the research is being focused. <clears throat> now, the rest of, most of the rest of what I'm going to talk about is memory from both a, from a road mapping standpoint and how the memristor fits into it. And um, <clears throat> embedded memory, um, when Stan talked about the memristor at, in, in 2007, the first time I saw that, the thing that really uh, intrigued me, and I think all the industry people in there, this, is, this looks really manufacturable. It's very simple. It's a, it's a, um, a cross point um, contact that, that gets you there. It's materials that we know how to deal with. This is what the industry looks for. But there's other uh, potential options, the one diode, um, one node kind of option. These, these things are, are what are, are being shown now in a research uh, environment for embedded memories. Um, now I'm going to talk about some of the emerging memory options that come out of the ITRS. So this is what has been uh, the ITRS, the International Technology Roadmap for Semiconductors, is something that hundreds of engineers get together every year, uh, experts in each part of this roadmap that's uh, several hundred pages thick, that talk about where the industry should be in the next 15 years. And they, one of the uh, categories in this roadmap is emerging memory options or emerging memory devices. And that's what I'm going to describe. So this is taken directly from the presentations on that that, that happened in, um, a month and a half ago. And what uh, I think is, is important to note is that of all of the potential candidates for new memories, there's only one new capacitive memory. The rest are all resistive memories. And this is where 
the, the action is, and this is where the scaled storage elements are um, predicted to be. Now, resistive change memory cells are, um, are come in a variety of, of, of flavors. The, the resistor is, is this guy down here. Um, but there's two, there's, there's really a fundamental aspect of this, and that is the switch between moving and storing charge in order to keep a, a, an element, to moving and storing either atoms or ions, but moving atoms. <laughs> and you can do that <clears throat> one of two ways. You can do into a phase change where you change the conductivity, or as um, all the discussion and, and everything that you guys have seen about how the uh, memristor works. And <clears throat> um, that, I think, from a pool knowledge of the people who have to manufacture these things, plus all the, uh, the academic researchers who are involved in these roadmaps, <coughs> this is the, the, this chart is basically where they think the, the future is going to be. And in the um, resistive change memory cells, that's where the most likely candidate is going to be. Now, what I'm going to do now is to segue into a form that we had in October, very similar to this, which I just described a moment ago. Again, it was, it was uh, it's very similar to this. It was um, supported by NSF and ASTAR, which is a Singapore um, kind of NSF organization, a government organization funding research, and SRC. And this was on the future of memories. The difference between what I show you on the ITRS and what I show you from this focused form is that it allows the form, like this one and like the one we had at Berkeley uh, in 2007, it allows um, the experts to get together. It's an invited-only conference where there's a lot of free flow of information and not all of it's disseminated after that um, in, in a public forum. So people talk pretty freely. Anyway, it's um, mostly industry people um, that, that are involved in this. And the way it's set up is we have a few keynotes, and then we have a panel for each area where we try to answer questions. So what I'm going to show you is excerpts from various talks in that forum. And then I'll, I'll end up with the questions that came out of that forum and then some questions that I think um, you know, feed into, into the next stage. So the conclusion of an ultimate charge-based memory is that all charge-based memories suffer from the barrier issue. Because this is what I say, the difference between um, charge storage versus moving ions around. Um, high barriers are needed for long retention, and they do not allow for fast charge injection. And it's difficult to match speed and voltages to logic. So, this is the voltage time dilemma of, of a, a charge-based device. So non-charge-based, non-volatile memories are really the choice. This just gets back to the um, resistive RAM. And just to, um, to illustrate that one more time, you know, with a, <coughs> with a um, standard MOSFET or a storage or a DRAM kind of storage, capacitive storage device, you're trying to confine electrons and trying to confine as little... Uh, as few as possible with the, uh, to give you the maximum signal, uh, confining ions is much easier. And it's really just because you're replacing ion, electron movement. Um, ion movement has a fundamental advantage due to the easier confinement of heavier particles. That's all it's about. Now moving atoms, here's one uh, um, just from a, from a Nature article that was, uh, that was shown. You know, an atomic scale switch, you can either make, uh, you, uh, move the, the atoms to, to make a, 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 a fuse or a, a reversible fuse. Um, but the, some of the qualities of these either phase change, ion moved devices, it's really the ability to distinguish between a read and, a, and an off or, a, or to distinguish, distinguishability, the on off ratio, how you can read and the retention due to these moving atoms. So you can have and, and stand and, and, and um, 
uh, Dimitri and, and uh, John Paul have all talked about uh, that aspect of uh, the memristor. So with that as kind of a, just a, an overview of, of what came out of both the ITRS and, and, the, um, and this memory form, um, I, didn't, I didn't want to go into, into um, deep detail of it, but I just wanted to, to give you kind of what, I'm as the messenger representing the industry, this is what the industry thinks. Now the last, last part of this is what the industry thinks about trying to distinguish amongst these, these uh, resistive ramps. So these are the questions that came out of the memory form, or the outcome that came out of the memory form. So the answer to the first question is, does there exist a universal memory element that could handle the wide range of applications for memory technologies? And the answer to that is, it's unlikely to, to there's large application space for memory technologies, ranging from the very low cost consumer applications to performance driven information uh, processing applications. So one solution for everyone that's going to revolutionize is not likely. But what are the most likely candidates for these diverse applications? Um, there are many options for embedded and non-volatile memory systems. Uh, to try to distinguish between them, uh, a metric based on minimum space action principle was proposed. And with that, the, the uh, resistive RAM technology appears to minimize this metric. So let me go into that detail a little bit. So the energy time uh, volume, just multiplying the energy, <clears throat> the time and the volume for, uh, um, for storage, for creating the, the, the node uh, or the element. And if you, you minimize that and you look at all the potential candidates, DRAM flash, um, spin torque uh, RAM, the, the resistive RAM, there's a, um, if you look at this parameter, this, um, in fact, I have this on. This parameter is really dynamically, uh, dramatically better for a resistive RAM. And that's the key thing. And this comes down to each one of these first two are moving store, uh, 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 electrons around. The spin um, torque magnetic RAM, I mean, that one's, uh, that's pretty exotic, but it's, it's got a long way to go. And it doesn't come near. It's four orders of magnitude off for this particular metric from the resistive RAM. Now, there is some um, caveats here. The main constraints for the DRAM is due to conditions on the remote sensor. So you need so much charge in order for that to work. Um, the constraints by the remote sensor are not considered in, in these two. But then this comes down to a lot of the research that's going on right now that, that uh, HP and others are doing on really um, how, how you, you access these memory elements. So I think it's, it, there's a lot more potential there. Um, certainly it's not going to be as, as uh, formidable a problem as the DRAM because there you're always worrying about losing the charge by reading it. Now, to continue the forum discussion and, and uh, um, just to give you a snapshot of uh, the biggest memory manufacturer and one representative of that is Dr. Ng Yu from Samsung. Um, he looks at, at these various art um, uh, resistive RAMs and gives kind of a, a plus minus on it. And for the, if we just zero in on, on the Mr. one, his biggest issue is, well, it, the pluses are, um, it's fast, it's got good endurance, um, good statistical distribution, it's low power and it's multi-level. But he thinks poor retention would be the issue. Now, this is, uh, you know, I, I'm not sure that this is valid, but this is part of the, of the selling of this device to people who are putting it in manufacturing. That's one man's opinion. If you look at the, uh, but if you look at it compared to the others, the, um, the metal ion motion based switch, the uh, fuse based, the fuse anti-fuse memory switching, um, there's, there's a lot of negatives on those and they're, they're not really considered for that reason. So questions remaining on this topic from an industry standpoint. 
is, does the ion migration offer a significant advantage retention and durability within the constraints of the needs for large-scale, low-cost manufacturing and process control? And I think this is sort of the, the crux of it all. It's, um, it's, uh, when you go past the, the laboratory and small-scale small uh, development, this is always the showstopper in all of that. Can you do this in, in large volume and make it a qualified product that has the, uh, that meets the consumer needs for cost, um, reliability, and, and, um, and lifetime? And another question, though, and this is what has come up in, I think, in, in both Dimitri's talk and some of the others, um, can the two-terminal uh, resistor brand control and sensing functions be implemented without the physical strengths of the process and operational limits. Um, and, you know, as a sub-bullet, the same pathway for both program and sense may place a, a heavier burden on external circuitry. Now, um, I think that you guys have solved this problem, but uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm still not sure. Um, and then more questions. Devices. What is the potential for analog memory using them versus? And this is, this is sort of looking ahead, you know. When you really get these working in memories and they're a fundamental element, they're so uh, easy to make and so cheap to make, well, you're going to see them in everything if that's the case, right? So you got it for analog memory, um, materials. What is the possibility to derive a formula for optimum material for mem resistors? Okay, so this is just, I think it's still early in the phase. There's probably a lot of, uh, of um, periodic table tweaking for these that might get you somewhere. The integration, are there specific advantages or disadvantages of mem resistors in respect to 3D integration and extreme patterning solutions? So things like directed self-assembly, that kind of stuff. And I think there, there is, because it's such a simple, um, uh, uniform, regular array that you'd be making, in, in, at least in, 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 um, in many cases. And physics, what are the scaling limits of mem resistors? Now, <clears throat> I'm, I'm, I know it's been addressed in these other talks, but when you get down to the defectivity, uh, it scares me when, when I see that, you know, the conduction path is, um, is, is a, a, a small part of the whole area and that it's going along phase boundaries and there's crystal and stuff going on in there. I mean, all that kind of scares me from, a, from what happens when you really make, um, when you scale it down to the size of the, of the paths that you're looking at. But these are, I, these are, these are the nice problems to have. So I think these are the kinds of questions that the industry is looking at for where this goes. Now, um, I, I said I, uh, when, I, when I talked about how research was done, I think what, what, what I see right now, all of the issues that I've laid out that are concerns of, of the industry are the things that HP is doing in a big way right now. So when I started out and saying one laboratory was working on the transistor 60 years ago, I really see this transformation into manufacture as going on. We're all looking to HP to, to get the job done. Right, Stan? I mean, it's, it's, uh, that's where the, the, this, this manufacturability, um, the cost of manufacture, the design for, for, door, for reliability, all of these things are going to be worked out. <coughs> anyway, that's all I had. I can answer any questions. Thank you very much for your excellent uh, <coughs> view on uh, technology. Is there any question? Now we can have uh, one or two questions. Seeing none, uh, thank you very much. Yes, a small talk about appreciation. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you.